not a con. I guess let's take a, let's get it going. I guess is that good with everybody to get started? And any objections at all? Great. Well, hey, Melinda, I have something for you. <laughs> Come on up here. Caught your prize. There you go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know what this is. It's jewelry. <laughs> I love a man who gives me jewelry. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, <laughs> this, this isn't so secret, is it? <laughs> I've got two of them. <laughs> and I've got two of them as well. <laughs> um, so actually, Melinda's going to be the, uh, the, the maid of honor at our wedding this summer, and so that's actually some jewelry from my wife-to-be for her. So um, that, that's what that's all about. I actually did have presents for the rest of you, believe it or not, and I was just talking to Brandon about this. I have in my car a large stack of books uh, that I've reviewed and, and received for free and stuff like that that simply don't fit on my shelves, and so I brought them, and the goal was to give them, give them away if you asked a good question. You could come up, get, 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 your, get, get your pick of books and stuff like that. Why did you read the books? <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this question does not get you a book, but it does get to an answer. <laughs> Even better than a book. Um, basically, they're like a block away, but the garage is all locked up, and it wasn't worth the felony to break in to get them. Um, but I think the garage might actually open up by the end of my talk, so I'll like, run over there, bring them back, and then just find me, and you can take books out of my big orange bag. Only one book spoken for, it's Alan's, um, other than that. It's things like uh, the, the Secure Shell book, the Kerberos book, things like things I've reviewed in Slashdot or elsewhere. So um, putting in books is just that they no longer fit in my shelf and I no longer have a need for them. The other interesting thing about this talk is, aside from finishing the slides at about 1.30 in the morning, um, I was just telling Chris about this. Basically, I, I developed the slides months ago, um, hoping to, prepare, to present this actually at PyCon in DC, because uh, actually all the code's written in Python. Um, they passed on it for whatever brain dead reason, but basically, <laughs> well, no, that's good because I, I actually love coming here to Nauticon and kind of giving like the first round of a presentation because it's a good audience, it's among friends, it's for friends, and um, the talk I gave last year, which I was actually only kind of awake for about half of it, um, I wound up basically flying halfway around the world to give, and I'm flying around the world giving it a few more times. So things that kind of start here for me wind up being pretty good. Um, so. I'm more, more than happy to kind of try out a, a brand new talk on you guys, and, as well as uh, some new techniques, basically, on my slides. So I've been reading this really cool PowerPoint si slide uh, site called beyondbullets.com. It's um, kind of a new idea of getting rid of uh, bullet points, uh, actually, in your PowerPoint talks. So I basically try to do that as much as possible in this. So I went from this very bullet point heavy presentation to this very picture centric uh, presentation. Last night I kind of brought back in a few bullet points. So that's kind of why the, uh, uh, the slides might be a little bit disorganized, why I might be a little bit disorganized up here and disoriented up here as well. Without any more explanation of what I'm talking about, um, I guess I'd start talking about it. RSS clustering is the topic um, and the title obviously. I'm here basically doing things that I do outside of work. What's interesting is that the topic itself, to me, kind of comes out of my need of basically digesting uh, lots and lots and lots of information in kind of a continuous stream. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But it originally came out of uh, my interest basically in trying to correlate IDS events and trying to understand large scale networks um, and how they basically uh, um, operate at a kind of a macro level in terms of security events so that you don't waste your time digging through millions and millions and millions of alerts. Um, or just simply throwing them away like most people do, actually. Um, hey there. <laughs> Come on, up. actually, he's up here. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass you. These are, it's, uh, Froggy's awesome, by the way. I want to say, say a big hearty thank you to Paul and everybody involved at Nauticon because I'm actually seeing some old friends of mine that I haven't seen in a while, which is a lot of fun, so. Like Vicky and Larry, so. <laughs> um, basically, um, what this comes down to then is, is more or less information management. RSS is kind of a, 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 an offshoot of that. And the reason I choose RSS is because I actually read an asset of RSS. And I find that I had to do something to kind of get beyond it. 
And um, this is the te this is the technique I came up with, and it's it's interesting. It's kind of there's there's a few of us in the world doing it. It's not terribly novel. Um, there's like I said, a few of us doing it, um, and it's kind of a, a takeoff, if you will, of Google News and topics and stuff like that as well. So the this is kind of a whole beyond bullets kind of thing that, I, that I'm kind of, kind of working with here, kind of stories. So um, what's, what's funny is this sort of resembles like what part of my apartment did during grad school. I love to read um, lots and lots of information, and I typically try and consume as much as possible. But one of the things that I found is that having stacks of newspapers around or stacks of magazines around isn't just a fire hazard. It's kind of, you know, gets in the way of things like that. Um, but basically, uh, it turns out I'm not alone in this kind of uh, this feeling. And we've, Chris, uh, a good friend of mine, dubbed it kind of the infovore. You are information hungry. You simply need to have the stream of information. Now, this information can actually be across multiple disciplines and multiple areas. Um, for example, I, I read about you know geopolitical events, geoeconomic events, uh, terrorism, all sorts of things like that. Uh, in addition to uh, information security and investing and, and all these other things, and just for fun and photo blogs from around the world, places I've, I've either been or people I know or people that I, I'd like to meet and stuff like that. So basically, I have this, this huge amount of information that I'd like to consume, kind of constructing, if you will, kind of this continuous evolving world picture. And I know that I'm not alone in that. There's lots of people, I think, who like to read a lot of different things. And secondly, I think with a lot of the um, things that have gone on here in the States in the past few years, we are more aware, I think, more aware than ever of kind of the nature of the news media business, which is to say uh, sort of self-censoring, sort of uh, spinning its own thing, as well as being influenced by outside spin masters. Uh, for example, I think we've all heard about how the current administration has paid thousands and thousands of dollars to various people to kind of pre prepare, pretend to be um, sort of objective or, or pundits, if you will, uh, inside, inside of an industry or inside of a, inside of a market. And it's kind of disturbing. And one of the ways that you can use to detect this is to actually consume lots of, lots of different sources of information. You can, you can detect, for example, spin. You can detect bias. You can detect um, kind of incomplete stories and kind of point up with a fuller, richer picture for yourself. And so you get this by basically digesting assets of information on a continuous basis. And, and you can't simply do this kind of like once a week. You have to do this more or less on an ongoing basis to kind of figure out what's going on so, and in this world. And like I said, I know that I'm not alone in that. And so, for example, when I walk by a stack of, uh, a row rather, of, of um, newspaper machines, I generally want to buy them all and kind of read them all. But you can't do that because you kind of wind up with this information overload, and you wind up more or less carrying around just piles and piles of paper every day. And, you, and where do you put it? You know, forests and stuff like that, simply getting burned down just for your information consumption and stuff like that. And it's not even terribly, um, it's not terribly comprehensive, right? There's like 10 or 12 here, and I'm reading something like 50 newspapers a day. I'm not reading them entirely, right? But I'm basically picking stories out of them uh, and kind of reading things that are interesting to me out of, 50, uh, out of like 50 different newspapers. That's even longer than this, and it costs me a small fortune every day just to keep up with it, in addition to massive amounts of time requirements that it would actually require. But this is kind of more or less what you can do with RSS. You can actually run around, you can download um, stories from newspapers all over the world um, and actually kind of keep, up, keep, keep abreast of, of, uh, news, of news stories this way. For those of you that aren't familiar with RSS, um, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, RSS is simply really simple syndication, or the RDF site summary. And it's an XML format that uses kind of a common set of uh, tags and namespaces to describe volatile content, dynamic content. So you have a title for a story, you have a link to the story, you have maybe a blurb or even the whole story itself, you have um, other information about the story, like the author and, and the time it was posted and things like that. And this works great for blogs, this works great for newspapers, this works great for uh, TV schedules and weather reports, et cetera. All these kind of things kind of that can be serialized out as a stream of items, as a stream of events and descriptions kind of work really well in this, in this tag. So that's basically it, right? It's basically serializing a very dynamic site and getting um, the items from those, the, those sites and those pages delivered to you in kind of an automated fashion. So the RSS Reader application um, is actually uh, a, a pull-driven application. And this is kind of the, the generic format of what the actual UI looks like. So on the left, you have this, uh, in green, you have kind of the list of feeds over here. And this kind of, how, how I'm going to segue, if you will, into uh, kind of the shortcomings of such a model at this point. 
So over here on the left, you have feeds. So these are sometimes grouped into folders. But you, know, you might have, for example, a news folder, which contains the newspapers that you like to read. You might have a, um, a list of your friend's blogs. You might have photo blogs, for example, that you, that you, that you like to keep track of. Um, and other news sources kind of group maybe by topic or maybe by source or something like that. Um, and then uh, on top, you have the individual, the individual stories. And then the bottom, you have an individual entry from, from that feed and from that from those stories. Um, you can actually read them in the text. And this is kind of how you surf through it. Looks a lot like Outlook in the sense that you have folders, you have messages within them, you have a message itself. And this is basically the workflow within that. So you select a feed, you have items in that feed, and then you go on and you read an entry. Now the RSS application does a lot of the heavy lifting for you, right? So instead of having to run around every morning or every hour even and check all these different sites, you know, what changed, what's new, what's, what's interesting, um, which simply doesn't scale after like a dozen sites for most people. Um, you spend all your time basically hitting reload in your web browser. This basically does that. Like every hour, every few hours, it runs around, it pulls down the new RSS feed, basically finds the new items, things that are new to its local database, and actually presents them to you as new. And then you can quickly scale through them. Obviously, you can look at per feed, you can say, OK, which, which feeds I'm interested in right now, which ones have new entries. Within the entries, you can look at you can look at the titles. You can say, okay, which ones kind of sound interesting, and then you can quickly skim the items, and of course, jump then to the web page for kind of a, a fuller picture. But ultimately, this is um, also the downfall of this application as well. When you start thinking beyond maybe one or two dozen feeds, so this is, for example, a screenshot of one of the, uh, the RSS readers that I use. It's called Sharp Reader. Um, for those of you that don't know, I actually run Windows XP. Uh, I used to run OpenBSD, but not anymore. But basically. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see a list of feeds, and some that are highlighted and some that aren't, um, or bold, rather, and some that aren't bold, uh, showing you which ones are new. Um, on the top here, then, we have a list of stories um, sorted by date, in this case, and then an, indi an individual story here. But what's immediately obvious is that if you look, actually, at the scroll bar here, it starts way over here, right? So I have a pile of feeds in here. And simply going through this and maintaining this, for myself and keeping abreast of this problem, and for people who are kind of in this position, is simply um, an untenable position to be in. You, you basically waste hours and hours and hours a day trying to basically keep up on this flood of information coming in. Now, there's a couple of things that really suck about this. Obviously, um, all you have is an indicator of something that's, that's either new, because it's in bold, or an unread, or something that's, that you've already read, which is kind of you know, normal, a normal face type. But basically, you have no other indicators here. And you can't, for example, mark a feed as being um, something that if a new item comes in, you have to know immediately. So for example, it could be, if you're interested in investing, it could be, say, stock market quotes. If you're interested in, in a topic of news, it could actually be, for example, breaking news on a topic. You have no mechanism within a typical RSS reader to kind of highlight and pop that for you as kind of a, a high priority event for you. It's a very flat space in that respect. And secondly, here's this application basically watching what you do and things that you like to, to look at. And it has no semblance at all, no knowledge, if you will, of overlap and duplication within these feeds because if you're reading several different, if you're reading a lot of different newspapers, you're going to see the same topics over and over again. But it also can't find the interesting things within there for you, either based upon what the community is talking about as kind of a buzz, or things that you like to read, kind of based upon your personal history. And so this is really the driving force of why I do what I do, kind of the shortcomings of a typical RSS reader. And so I'm going to try and use the characteristics of the flood that kind of make it unmanageable and kind of unwieldy to try and manage the flood itself, right? So the big annoying thing is if you read the New York Times, the AP, BBC, Guardian, um, UPI, et cetera, you're basically reading about the same story maybe a dozen times in any hour. And this gets really an, an, an annoying, but also kind of untenable. It doesn't really help you kind of figure out the, the interesting bits of this. You skim over them, but in fact, basically you're missing interesting points within them because each of these has a different perspective on it. But it'd be great to be able to use this duplication to kind of highlight everyone's talking about this. Maybe this is interesting. And so here we have, for example, a number of stories that are, that are um, interesting. Within a set of uh, three feeds in this case, we have these, these individual bars here are, are, the, are, the actual, um, are the actual stories that, that are interesting. So we have unread stories or sort of interesting things here in red and things that are not so interesting in, in black. And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take this into the next step, and we're going to find ones that are related. We're going to group them together here, and we're going to make a cluster of them. So what we've done immediately is we've taken 
three stories that made one cluster, one story out of it. Again, very, very useful, but it's also highlighted for you the interesting things out of those feeds. And that's ultimately the wall that we're going to do here with this. We're going to keep repeating this process over and over and over again. I'll explain sort of how it works. But that's really the gist of it right there. You basically go from unstructured information to something that has more structure to it. Still somewhat unstructured, but it has more structure to it. You know, and before, plus you've also reduced the clutter. You kind of highlighted what's interesting out of this. And this is the kind of stuff you get out of it. So for example, I snapped this uh, late last night. Um, but you get an idea immediately of what's, uh, what's possible with this. So here, I've actually cut across a number of different news sources. And this is kind of scaled down. But you can see how everything kind of related to the Charles and Camilla wedding yesterday is grouped together as a single set of stories. So if I don't care about this, I've, I've instantly reduced my, my workload. But I've also found, kind of within a page, all the interesting things. So if I was curious about this, I've, had it, I've got it all in one centralized place. Because everyone's talking about it, it must be interesting, right? It's kind of the, the base assumption of this. Um, you can, of course, ignore it if you really want to. But the, you know, typically, you'll find very, very interesting things here. And this is, this, is, you know, this is also the output of it as well. It's kind of ugly HTML, sort of functional. I basically whipped it up at like 2 in the morning one night. But it more or less works, and I haven't really had to change it. But you can see that I've got you know, the AP here. I've got um, NPR, Reuters, New York Times, et cetera. All these kinds of things basically feeding this, this news site, grouping together and cutting across them. And so if I wanted, for example, to get the, MP, the you know, New York Times perspective, that's easy to do. Um, what you don't see here, for example, is the Guardian or the BBC. For example, I wanted the British perspective, India Times, if I wanted the, you know, the, the, the Commonwealth perspective, for example. All these kinds of things are possible because now I can kind of cut across dozens of different news services, find the interesting things based upon what they're talking about, group them together, and now you have a centralized place to get information about a topic. Very, very useful and um, very, very interesting indeed. This is a, a, a cluster Cosmos that I developed a couple of years ago. Uh, about a year ago, actually. Um, and what's interesting here, these are basically stories grouped together and then graphed. And this is kind of, forms kind of a cosmos here and sort of a, I mean, Cameron over here is an astrophysicist, and I'm sure he probably uh, winces at the, at the use of that term, but it's kind of an ugly star chart, right? But what's immediately obvious here are a number of things, and that's kind of the idea that these lumps and these clusters are very, very um, intuitive, right? So here we have, for example, a very, popular subject that's actually receiving a lot of attention from the press and a few others that are kind of that big, a lot of smaller ones and some medium-sized ones and stuff like that. Again, really, really interesting and very, very intuitive in that you can quickly scan this. You can look and say, OK, what's, what's interesting here? I don't actually work with this kind of visualization. I simply use it to kind of measure the, the quality of the grouping here. Um, but you can kind of see how things kind of lump together like this instantly. So you're probably wondering how you get to do this yourself, right? It's kind of a, a, a relatively simple process that um, has a few direct steps to it, and no, it doesn't really have to iterate very, very deeply. So in step one, basically what you do is you gather all of the feeds together. And again, this is some data from last night on the actual aggregator system that I use. <clears throat> you actually gather all the information together. And so now you have this kind of corpus of, of news items. And I gather something like about 1,000 together at a time. Because uh, I'm reading something like 60 uh, sites or something like that, I think, at, at any one time. Um, but basically, what you get is, is uh, a list of, of news stories. And we can actually do this just on headlines alone. Don't even have to look at the bodies of the news stories to do this. So in step one, you've gathered them all. You can see kind of, um, I've actually chosen, if you will, in this case, a, a very specific cluster of stories. But you, know, you can see how, how, uh, um, how these naturally fit together. And in step two, what we do is we drop what are called stop words. So in search engine terminology, stop words are things that don't add any real semantic meaning. So they're, in this case, you know, it's a lot of the word too. Um, it's kind of dropped out. If you can see it clearly, it's kind of in light, light blue. But basically, um, things that are simply too small or things that are simply um, too common and don't, aren't unique to a story, specific to a story, you basically drop them out because they have nothing to, to really add here. And in step three, then you stem the words. So what I use here is what's called the porter Semmer algorithm. Very, very simple um, algorithm, very direct, kind of almost naive in a lot of respects as well. And what it does is it um, takes the words, basically, and drops common English endings. So it drops the ED, it drops the ERS, it singularizes them, drops the ER, it drops basically all the modifiers, these words, and you left them with a root word. In this case, all these stories are centered around the word bomb. Yes? Do you uh, 
uh, use a dictionary to make sure that you're not turning things into th, for example? Um, I think actually in the algorithm itself, I think it has kind of checks like that. There's no, it doesn't quite use a dictionary. I think it uses a few thresholds like does it contain, you know, not just consonants, but also vowels and stuff like that. Uh, it is a really you know, dead simple kind of uh, um, almost like I said, naive kind of implementation of stemming words, but it's basically kind of one of the common things in, in natural language processing. I would actually drop out um, th out of that because yeah, you got from from things to thing, then to th as you as you note, because it's simply too small and simply isn't isn't interesting anymore. Um, but that that is, I think, a concern. I don't I don't ever run across it. So looking at it, uh, I don't I, I think it basically looks for. Essentially, it is a kind of a word, but it doesn't use a dictionary. But again, you know, what's interesting is you've kind of uh, cluttered, you reduced the kind of the clutter down uh, into kind of a, a, a common term here, in this case, bomb, right? So Eric Rudolph has associated with the word bomb, and all these words are associated with the words bomb, right? He was a bomber, he had a bombing, um, something was bombed, et cetera. All these relate to bomb. And in step four, we then perform basically a, a, a two step process. We find the most frequent words, the most frequent stems, and we then rank order them from most to least frequent, group them together, and then we basically find all these stories related to this. So we basically walk down the list. So bombs, um, or bomb rather than you know, Camilla and Charles, et cetera, and so on and so forth. And you kind of walk down the list of stories here, and you basically pull them out of this database, throw them then into a cluster. And what I typically do to achieve a layout like this is I actually choose the one that's the longest because it's going to have the most information in the description. Not necessarily the best or the most interesting, but it just has the most information kind of at the top of this because I only display this description for the first one and the, all the other ones, you know, it would just be too much clutter. Wouldn't really help the process along at all. Ah, there we go. But basically, you find the most frequent um, stems because you basically uh, sum them up and then you uh, down the least frequent ones, and you basically pull the stories out. Now, stories can only appear in one group. So the goal here, and the implicit assumption, is that it's going to basically be um, uh, a very unique identifier. It's not going to be a very popular identifier. So Charles and Camilla, for example, uh, is probably not going to appear um, in any one day um, frequently in, in any other uh, uh, group of stories, for example. But it could. So, for example, the term Iraq, um, this, this, uh, for the past two years, has appeared kind of in multiple subtopics, if you will, but it's typically grouped, all grouped under Iraq. So, for example, you have elections, you have bombings, you have um, Iraqis getting pissed off about stuff, and so on and so forth, and all these things are kind of all subtopics, but they're all, unfortunately, grouped under the term Iraq. And so uh, that has kind of a, a natural consequence here with that as well. Yes? How do you deal, if you're just assigning one cluster, how do you deal with collisions? Collisions meaning like a story should bomb appear. Well, whatever pops up first. It's another unfortunate um, assumption, if you will, in the in the model, and that is that um, more or less that these are unique identifiers, kind of across all stories, which is not necessarily true as well. I actually have some sort of um, manual. Uh, it's not basically. It's kind of built into my method and my implementation of the method, but it's not really inherent in really any of the algorithms that, I, that, I'm, that I'm stealing from the people and using for the people to kind of drop things that might cut across or basically a lot of different topics. So for example, I actually rip out the word security because it applies to Iraq and Tulsa security, which itself are not very, very interested. But if two of them were talking about it, right, securities would appear basically at, at this, as, as a frequency that is the, you know, the sum of both the Iraq security and the social security problem as well. It would dominate over social security and Iraq as well. And so I drop things like that out of it as well. But basically because they're, they're not terribly interesting identifiers kind of in the end, and, and they do have a lot of false positives. And so that kind of collision and that kind of thing uh, I do take care of. I have thought about taking care of the first case I described, the Iraq situation, for example, where you have two or three different subtopics underneath that by actually looking at the size of the resulting cluster. And if it's over some sort of threshold, right, basically performing a second analysis on just that, find me the next most interesting terms out of this, which might be, for example, uh, soldiers getting killed, which might be then voting, which might be um, parliament and stuff like that. So then three natural subgroups that kind of pop out of that. 
and then you basically discard the word Iraq because it's no longer a unique enough identifier in that case for that group. But these are subgroups and they kind of become parent groups, if you will, in that respect. So I haven't yet implemented that, but that's basically the way I think that probably the simplest and very useful way to do it, I think. It seems like it would also kill off, kill off the need to do the, 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 black, the blacklisting of the word security because it would naturally take care of it. In theory, yeah, in theory. But um, I think that it's probably an issue kind of of that, of that threshold, right? So um, really within any group, you're going to find subgroups, right? Over two or three different you know, headlines grouped together, you're going to basically have two, you know, maybe one or two different subgroups within that. And so I have to find that magic threshold and, and see if it's distinct enough. Melinda? Something that's endemic to things that use clustering is the problem of choosing how many numbers of clusters to use. So it's just that it's pretty much, um, I mean, if you have uh, genetic research, if you have software engineering stuff that uses clustering, that's basically one of the big unanswered questions is how many bins do you divide this thing into? And there's really no way around it. Yes and no, right? So. That, that's most popularly implemented as the k-means clustering, clustering algorithm, right? Yeah. Where you basically say, I'm going to have n clusters or k clusters in this case, and then you basically try and f you see them, and then you basically iterate until they are, they're stable. Yeah. I'm actually not doing that. So this is actually a great segue into kind of differences between what I'm doing here and other techniques that you might expect as well. I use the term clustering kind of loosely. I'm not actually doing great clustering in the sense of hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering, or star clustering being three very popular techniques to do that. Um, but I'm so I'm actually more doing kind of a grouping or kind of a lumping even. Right? So let's not even call it cl clustering. Let's call it lumping, if you will, kind of lumping them together. But um, w the other thing I think that should be apparent by this point is that unlike a system like Bayesian classification techniques or other kinds of uh, uh, even k-means in this case, right? We'd actually have to kind of ass um, assume what the centers are going to be. Right? So a lot of folks like to think about classification in terms of Bayesian analysis because it's what they're most familiar with after, after Paul Graham's uh, plan for spam essay. Um, it turns out that, that Bayesian techniques wouldn't necessarily work very well on this because you have to basically know what the 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 the, co the clusters or the groups are going to be in the first place. So it turns out that that doesn't work out very well. So I'd have to basically sit down like once a week, think about you know, what's happening now, what's likely to happen in the future. This whole thing basically is self-driven. Based on, based on word frequencies and, and stem frequencies, right? That's how, that's how it works. And so basically finds interesting things that pop out of nowhere, if you will, that he wouldn't have been able to come up with in the first place. And sec secondly, while people, most people typically use Bayesian classification mechanisms, in, either in spam or, in, or in, even in RSS clustering, is kind of a um, a few kind of larger groups of things, like this is news, this is technology, this is fun, this is whatever. And here, I'm, this is all news, right? This is only across news sources. And so it's all news, duh. <laughs> but I can't really, I guess I could call it domestic and foreign, but that doesn't really kind of give me the fine grain analysis I'm looking for as well. And so unlike Bayesian techniques, are un, um, I don't really have to uh, know, if you will, ahead of time what these clusters might look like. And same thing with k-means clustering as well. I, I, I could probably randomly pick centers, but um, again, that, that I don't think would necessarily work as well as it as uh, it might actually work better. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't implemented it. But it seemed harder to do, and this seemed to kind of do the job for the most part. And I wasn't quite sure the benefit of that over kind of a brute force uh, word frequency, stem frequency um, approach. I could, I guess, you know, pick hundred different clusters or whatever, but then I'm kind of limiting myself, if you will, as well to that number of clusters and finding the interesting ones in that may, not, may or may not necessarily work as well. Also, came in clustering is somewhat slow and, with respect to, uh, to things. You have to actually iterate repeatedly to kind of wait until the, the clusters themselves stabilize because you, you basically, the Cambridge clustering algorithm is really, really simple. As Melinda pointed out, you basically pick some centers and the, you, know, you throw darts, basically, and you find things that are kind of within um, some sort of distance within that. And it's also, they come up with the distance algorithm as well, which may not necessarily um, work out so well. Like a look at Levenstein or Hamming or something like that, but it doesn't necessarily work all the time. It has to have some sort of higher order semantic meaning, I think, rather than just the actual characters themselves. So once you actually pick the centers, you basically find the things within a certain distance, you call that a cluster, and then you recalculate the center of that cluster based upon the data within the cluster. You repeat this process ad nauseum until basically your clusters stabilize so that they aren't changing from one iteration to the next, or they reach some sort of threshold level that you're happy with, There's some sort of tolerance you're happy with. It's terribly slow, <laughs> unfortunately. 
But also, I don't have a good distance algorithm, which is probably the other reason why I didn't do it. Rick? So this to me seems like a classic example of the, the hack mentality that we have a lot here, in that there's all these fancy algorithms that are very simple. And it might not work quite as well as Snow's in many situations, but it seems to work pretty well. So the question is, how well does it actually work? Can you give us an example? <laughs> Do you have like all kinds of random things that don't make any sense, or does it actually help you a lot in your reading? Can you give us an example? It helps. Okay. So, well, so I don't have any quantitative measure of how, how well it works. They're, it's all qualitative. Because I, I don't really have really any measure of, of goodness or fitness of yeah, these clusters. Well, it's it's much much deeper than that, right? It's really a semantic issue at heart. True. But how often do you do you run into misclassified stories that are very obviously misclassified to you? Such Most of the time. <laughs> I mean, um, most of the time, honestly. So what's funny is that, um, like in the Eric Rudolph bombing thing, right? In that cluster, were actually a couple of articles about a uh, bomb that exploded in, in Iraq. And so that's obviously a misplacement, but it's obviously about a bomb as well. And if, for example, um, uh, somebody had said, you know, that this comedian bombed tonight, you know, that also would have been grouped in there as well. Um, <laughs> right, again, way off topic. So I, I guess I, um, it, it is a pretty gross hack in a lot of ways, but for the most part it works because you're looking at more, I'm, I'm more or less quickly looking over the dominant set of data there over, as, as, as compared to, say, um, the, you know, the true uh, nature of the clusters. Um, I'll explain a, a little bit of some of the other things that can go on there as well, but more or less, Comparing it then to Google News or comparing it to Topics, for example, which are other two other sites that actually do news aggregation and clustering um, and grouping, I should say, um, they're much better at it than I am for a variety of reasons, including better, better, better much better algorithms, but also um, maybe 100 times more sources than I've got here. But there's a, a consequence to that as well, um, which I'll explain in a little bit. Larry. What do you do grouping and by single words rather than word pairs or triplets. Diagrams and trigrams. So I'm not, uh, I should, right? That'd be fantastic to be able to do it that way. Like for example, like White House, right, would, would obviously stand out just fine. Or President Bush would also stand out just fine, as opposed to President or, or whatever. Um, but it, it uh, I basically never implemented it. <laughs> That's kind of what it comes down to. Um, it's a shame that I haven't as well because I think that that would improve the accuracy somewhat for a number of topics, Sierra Leone, for example, or the, or the Dominican Republic. Things like that would kind of you know stand out a little more strongly, as well. But um, I just never did it. Never figured out a, a cheap way to do it, if you will. <laughs> I mean, and this is all about totally, totally being cheap. This is something like a twenty. The, the core algorithm itself is something like uh, so. Porter summer is like two hundred lines of Python. Um, I think that the core. The whole thing is basically like 100, another, maybe another 100 lines of Python around that. Um, so I'm all about the cheap. And I wrote this like at 2 AM one morning. <laughs> so it, and it worked well enough. Um, diagrams and trigrams would definitely improve it a lot as well. But there's other things I think that um, I could, as long as I'm going to go there, I may as well probably go another mile and kind of look at true natural, natural language processing. We're looking at, for example, you know, the appearance of um, nouns and verbs, but also classes of nouns and verbs, for example, that appear together and trying to find distances between them, if you will. So for example, um, Eric Rudolph always appears near the word bomb, right? So therefore, find things that cover the three of those things, not just the term bomb, but also find you know, things that might cover Rudolph as well, right? Um, but then, then you get some issues like you know, first name, last name, do you, you know, and, and things like that. Um, also, my method doesn't deal with truncations. So if somebody, for, or abbreviations, I should say. So if somebody actually said, for example, US rep, um, you know, whoever, I don't actually expand that out then to you know United States House Representative member, et cetera, kind of thing like that. So it has a lot of hackish shortcomings, unfortunately. But diagrams and trigrams have definitely been in my mind. I just never figured out a fast way to do it. So getting into other good things out of this, right, that I've kind of worked up. So um, one of the funny things you can do, so this is all first order analysis, if you will, and kind of the, the current corpus of news data. And so the other interesting things you can do are second order analysis and on this. So I've got news data that uh, spans about two years at this point. And one of the things I got curious about is kind of the appearance of data over time, kind of the, the terms over time. During the presidential election and kind of the, the run up, if you will, the presidential election last year, I got really curious to find out if some of the negative press that was appearing about the job situation, the failure to create number, uh, high number of jobs, was actually going to um, 
have a negative impact, if you will, on kind of the visibility of President Bush um, and, and potentially, and kind of look at, you know, uh, if these two are if linked, if you will. And it turns out that they're not very, very linked at all. In fact, you know, Jobs didn't get nearly as much mention as President Bush, thanks to the variety of reasons. But ultimately, um, what this kind of thing shows me is that um, it doesn't quite have the, the true linkage uh, uh, analysis that I was really hoping for, um, which I'll explain in just a second, but it does kind of give other kind of indicators that you can look at as well. So one of the other things I do in my job um, is actually a lot of marketing analysis these days. And so one of the things that I took upon myself to do was to kind of analyze uh, press visibility of the Democratic and Republican tickets and to find out, for example, um, was there enough traction going on? Were they getting enough traction? Were they getting a message out very effectively? And what's interesting is that um, you can kind of pick out some interesting features based upon this graph here. So in red and green are Bush and Kerry. And as you'd expect, being the headliners on the tickets are actually appearing much more frequently than Cheney and Edwards here in blue and purple. And the, other, the interesting things that kind of pop out of here are, for example, the Democratic convention when uh, Edwards is picked, Edwards dropping out of the race right before the convention. The, um, a few weeks later, then you have the, uh, the actual Republican convention and stuff like that. And then um, you, know, the, you've got the, you actually have the VP debates done here as well. Things like this pop, kind of pop out. And what, what's interesting is that I was actually able to look at this, and, and a few months even before they started talking about it, noticed that there was simply a failure to get consistent traction in the press based upon um, looking at you know, maybe 60 different sources of, 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 of news and primary sources at that kind of finding out, uh, for example, that, that the Carrie Edwards team just failed to kind of get their message out repeatedly. Um, and also, then there's also a, a bully pulpit um, effect from the White House, right? If, if, if the White House sneezes, it's news, right? So obviously, you've kind of got this whole gaggle of reporters that are interested in whatever you do. And so you can say, you can say whatever you want, and you get much more, much more visibility that way. That's also apparent here as well. Um, now on to some of the, the other caveats here, which are kind of, uh, kind of larger sweeping caveats. You guys have identified a couple of them as well. Um, one of the really shortcomings, one of the really big shortcomings of it is a failure to kind of work across languages. So here I've got French, Spanish, and English, all about the Charles and Camilla wedding. And you can see that it might kind of work for Camilla. It doesn't work for Charles, because, well, Charles, Carlos, and Charles. Um, but ultimately, um, this is really one of the, the big breakdowns of the system is it only works for one language. So if I worked in French, I could probably find enough French sources and, and, and do it there. I chose English because it's what I know best. But um, unfortunately, I can't, for example, bring in Le Monde. I can't bring in a few other things. I would love to be reading as well, um, like The Star and things like that and El Pais, you know, some of my favorite newspapers from around the world and kind of different perspectives because they simply don't group into this very, very well. The other thing about this is even if it's in English, if the writers are using, for example, um, different terminology to express what, what's going on, um, then it has difficulty in identifying what's really going on there. So for example, um, the Atlantic or the New Yorker might actually write about, you know, Social Security and say, now is a winter of our discontent, you know, and that would be the headline of the story and some sort of flowery language that introduces, if you will, uh, the story. But, in, you know, it takes a while to kind of get down into describing that it's about Social Security, for example. But here, because we're only looking at kind of well-structured, commonly structured headlines and, and news bodies, we don't really necessarily identify it with that because it looks so much different. It's, it looks like more, more like literature than, than it does than, um, than, than a news story. This works so well for news, and unlike um, blogs, for example, because daily newspapers have a very, very consistent format of how they actually express stories and, and headlines as well. And it's really uh, driven by that, that feature, that it's a very rigid style because, well, it's not so much it's enforced, it's just that it's effective. Um, and so, it, again, the, the, real, the language thing doesn't simply cut across languages, it really cuts within the language as well. The second thing is, is um, kind of a, a, a common thing you're always going to find kind of with a power law relationship. So if, if hopefully you guys are familiar with power law relationships, that's kind of what's shown here as well. But basically, um, you have frequencies and, and number of occurrences here. And the dashed line represents more or less what we find clusters together, which is to say a very, very small number of things. It's actually this very, very heavy tail that bites us in the ass with this method as well. So you guys were asking about the number of clusters and the quality of them. They actually do trickle out and kind of get smaller as time goes on. But what's really unfortunate is some of the more interesting things that, for example, might be a special report in, say, the LA Times don't necessarily bubble up because it's only them writing about it. 
right? So the thing that you may actually want to read doesn't necessarily bubble out, doesn't group into this because it's not really a topic that anyone else is talking about. It really drives on the fact that very, it's, it's a frequently occurring topic in a lot of different newspapers, a lot of different sources as well. And so the heavy tail problem here um, really kind of, like I said, bites us in the ass. And so I actually have to walk around like, on Sunday mornings, typically over a cup of coffee, actually reading different newspapers to find the interesting stories there. Rick? Do those all at the end, do they get clustered anyway, even though they're not related? Or do they all come up with separate stories? So I actually don't, don't even show them. Oh. No, yeah. I think, I think if you cluster those, you get a lot of the clusters, and it's kind of a linearization of the power law. Right. Um, that, that might actually be a way to do it, but I actually don't show them, only because the, the, the clutter on the page would just be so great. I should look at doing it, though, because then I can, on one page, kind of find the interesting stories, if you will. Nice, those are the ones I, that I usually would be most interested in. Most of the stuff like Charles McMillan I could care less about. Charles McMillan I could, I could definitely care less about. But for example, you know, um, so making that like the a, 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 yeah, a, for, but for example, a summary of, of Alan Greenspan's testimony for Congress is very interesting to me. And you want to look at maybe two or three different views on that. But um, ultimately, you know, yeah, they have the really interesting stuff down at the bottom. I, I should probably look at doing that. But I, I just want to reduce the load time also for the page as well. Sure. So it's got a kind of a, it's just, it's this huge amount of clutter. Um, even though, the frequencies aren't necessarily high. The volume of the heavy tail actually well overwhelms actually the, 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 the head of it. And finally, um, kind of the echo chamber effect. Uh, this is like the best thing I come up with for an echo chamber at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, <laughs> actually, is, is uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about in terms with respect to Google News and topics as well. Um, Google, if you notice, they, for example, will, will not just cluster AP and UPI, for example, they'll also cluster how it's reprinted across hundreds of different sites. And this has what basically the echo chamber effect as well. So if a very high profile news source, in this case the AP, gets a story out and it's picked up by 100 different affiliates, it's magnified that much more. And so it begins, to, it begins to dominate kind of the, the, the news view. And you kind of lose, if you will, the, the interesting uh, nature of it because it's artificially inflated. And that's the unfortunate I think, uh, effect of that as well. And so this is why I've stuck as much as possible in my methods. And I encourage you, if you're looking at this kind of thing, to stick as much as possible to those primary sources. Find the AP, find, you know, basically find the original writers and syndicate their, their content and, and hold on to that because then you really don't suffer from uh, you, you have a different echo chamber effect, which is to say um, everyone talking about the same stories, but they're talking about it differently. And that's kind of what we're after here, is kind of those different perspectives on world events. Um, I'm going to wrap up my talk now. I want to point out a few other things that are, that are somewhat interesting here as well. Classifier for J is one of those uh, Java libraries that actually does a little bit of um, classification. This is, like I said, this is all written in Python, but um, there are some people looking at it. One of the things is, um, that it does is it does some semantic indexing and can actually determine, for example, based upon some semantic markup and semantic discovery, things that are interested, uh, things that are interesting across boundaries. And that might actually be, might actually work for very low volume uh, corpuses, for example, in this case. But it also has Bayesian methods built in. So again. One of the caveats with that is you have to train it beforehand kind of the things that you're interested in, the bodies that you're interested in. An RSS base is just a raw implementation of an RSS, uh, a Bayesian filter rather, against RSS as opposed to mail or some other body of text. Down at the bottom here, I have a few other things that are really interesting as well and kind of driving this for me as well. Scatter gather is a very interesting technique for analyzing large amounts of data by um, basically looking across various bodies within that and, and kind of pulling together the things that are very, very interesting. There's actually an implementation, again, in Python that's very interesting, and I might actually look at, at rolling it in to see if it, if it has anything to, that, that can actually benefit me. Newsburst is a thing from CNET, which actually, actually does kind of this, which actually does this kind of clustering and grouping and lumping, if you will, on kind of a smaller basis in the tech world. Again, very interesting. It kind of, CNET actually goes out, finds the hot topics in the industry, and kind of groups them together. And finally, the open text summarizer really uh, uses more or less kind of the same methods, it turns out, um, that I'm using as well by basically breaking down and moving stop words, stemming, and finding the interesting things actually within a single story, and finding the one or two sentences that really summarize a large story, for example, um, that way. Again, very, very useful way to, to look at lots of information very quickly. Um, but it only works in one document. I actually work across documents with this as well. And that's it. So I encourage you to kind of look at um, things like this for kind of dealing with large amounts of data and large amounts of signal, whether it be IDS alerts like I was originally interested in, whether it be RSS and news and things like that. Um, 
one of the other things I think that I should note about it is if you run this, for example, across the 100 or even a, even a thousand blogs that you might read, finding, for example, the meme or the interesting things that people are talking about across that is very, very difficult to do because people are talking about you know, thousands of different things. The press is, of course, paid to write about you know, the, the interesting stuff and, and get their perspective on it. Um, so that's what works very well there. If you look at, for example, blog decks or pop decks, they're looking at tens of thousands of blogs, hundreds of thousands of blogs, in fact. And the, the memes that they're finding you know, occur in maybe a dozen different sites. And that's like a number one meme for the day. Very, very interesting stuff. It's just you have to uh, significantly cast a wider net uh, to actually find the, the interesting things that, that pop out there. And they're already doing it for you, so you may as well they actually just, just lift up on that. Um, hopefully, I've introduced you to a few interesting te techniques and, and topics, not just RSS, but also some of the algorithms you know, that, that I'm employing, some of the methods that I'm employing or not employing, in fact, um, to kind of think about new ways of, of analyzing da data streams. And with that, I would like to open it to more questions. So thank you very much. In back? Right. And it grabs those and goes, this didn't fit with anything else. Right. But I think you'll like it, so this is the other category. So that, that is a, actually a fantastic idea, um, and, I, and I should look at doing it. One of the reasons why I'm not is that actually Monkey doesn't allow for CGI bins to actually be executed. <laughs> By, by users, so I, I can actually have like a Python script running in, in my CGI bin directory um, that actually would gather that data and stuff like that. Um, I was kind of leery of that originally, though, when, even when I started thinking about this project. Um, Sightseer actually had a, a really interesting news clustering, news, news grouping service uh, briefly called, called Newsseer. And it, actually built, it was actually based upon a feedback system. Um, so at the time, I think it was the DC snipers were going on at the time. And so I read a couple of stories by the DC snipers, and it basically kept coming back with nothing but DC snipers. So it was probably poorly tuned, but the idea is that it, it, it really never kind of caught on the fact that, well, I don't really care about that anymore. And it didn't really find the interesting new stuff that might be totally off the wall or unpredictable. Um, and so I've kind of been leery about using feedback systems only because they wind up in this loop that is very hard to break out of, um, yet retains a sort of structure. So obviously, the thing could just throw random things at me and let me, uh, and kind of find, for example, okay, well, you know, that didn't stick to the wall, but you know, something did, and kind of use it to seed, if you will, a new spiral. Um, but I think that uh, it's a little more complicated, probably, than I, I wanted to touch upon two in the morning. But <laughs> but I think it's I think it, I think it might have some merit and might have some some uh, some some utility, and I think that. Again, presenting, as you, know, you and Rick pointed out, presenting basically that heavy tail and kind of letting me sift through it. And you brought up a really good idea, I think, about utilizing kind of information to kind of bring up and find the interesting stuff in that sea of, of crap um, to kind of find the interesting stuff. And uh, I think that has a lot of value. So I think I'll, I'll look into that, actually. It's a good idea. Todd, in back. Um, how about using a translator service or something for your front pages, not for you to read? That's a that's actually another good idea as well. So one of the I, I kind of thought about it, but I mean, if you have, I don't know, Babelfish is pretty decent, but it's kind of choppy at times. One of the um, it, I think it has a lot of value in, in a lot of things, but it, maybe like a third of the time, I think some of the the terms are that that pop out are more or less proper nouns or, or proper you know basically uh, very very specific things that don't necessarily translate at all, and so it may not necessarily get translated and still appear in, in the original language. Um, but that's actually a pretty good idea as well. I think that that might actually improve it. The problem with there is that it's maybe like three different sources that I want that I don't normally get. Le Mans and El Pais and, and a couple other things, for example. Um, I just want to look at my French. That's kind of why I'm interested in, in, you know, in, that, in, in, in reading French, for example. Um, but also the French perspective, um, just to piss off a coworker of mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's true as well, but I think that um, I think that the 
the dominant stories probably would pop out, I think. So I, it's, it's worth looking at, but I'm not, it, the, the work to the, the benefit ratio for me was pretty low, but it actually has some value. I think that as more foreign language and super screen appear online, the value is probably increasing significantly. So I should look at that, and that's a, that's a good idea. Alan, and then I'll come over here. <laughs> Speak up. You've been applying your clustering to regular feeds, like regular like stuff, like that. Um, I was just wondering how well this clustering technique might work, or if you even try this using um, techniques like techniques, like stuff like Z.com and ZDNet, you know, places like that. The reason that I mention that is because with a lot of tech news, you might get uh, a lot of words that you know might not necessarily be in sort of those filler words like two or the, but that still appear a lot in. A wide number of articles that can cover a lot of things, words like Microsoft, words like virus, words like security, things like that. So I was just wondering if you've tried using clustering techniques with any of those kinds of things. At the, so Alan's asking about using um, the clustering techniques on. A, a, a different niche or a smaller niche, in this case, like a, the, the tech, uh, t like, technolo like, like technology news, um, where in fact a lot of people will actually write more or less the same story across different sources. Um, so, for example, um, Microsoft releases you know patches, and there's a dozen stories about it. For example, um, that has crossed my mind at the time I looked at it, which was about two years ago. The number of sources was so small that good clusters didn't form. But I think that the number of sources since then has skyrocketed, and so it might actually be worth revisiting. My fear is my fear at the time was basically failure to find unique identifiers that had any real contribution, as you pointed out, Microsoft virus, et cetera, um, which are not unique enough identifiers. So in any, in any five day period, for example, like there's a dozen different stories with Microsoft, and they aren't necessarily um, all about the same thing. So I, I, should, I should revisit that as well, but at the time, that's why I was scared away from it, or, or I tried it and failed and moved on pretty quickly. Todd? Yeah, um, if you thought about going back to the weighting, not weighting individual words necessarily, but weighting sources or weighting links to sources, like Blogdex, if you clicked on a link that someone else on Blogdex had also linked to, maybe you weight something that that person has linked to higher in the future. Um, I hadn't really thought about that. One thing that quickly comes to mind, though, is kind of the, the spiral that I talked about earlier before. But also, I basically seeded it with, with a bunch of sources that I more or less trust or respect and for a variety of reasons. So for example, I'm not getting, you know, um, if you haven't figured it out, I'm, I, I, I'm not leaning right in terms of my politics. And so I'm not getting, for example, very conservative um, approaches to things more, more often than not. Um, in fact, my, my coworker I'm trying to piss off by reading French and talking about French news topics. Um, pissed, you know, he, he got pissed about this. He's like, it's all liberal, you know? <laughs> um, but in fact, um, Maybe. Again, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think about necessarily the value of that. I'm basically using a very simplistic approach to it and kind of works, like I said, it works well enough that I haven't really felt like investing twice the amount of time to do this. This, this is only a few hours of the work after you know, months and months of, of tinkering and thinking, but actually the current limitation was relatively fast. Um, so I don't know, maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Yes? Is the code available? Uh, the code's not available, and it's not going to be, at least for some time. I've had some discussions with some friends about um, <clears throat> uh, getting paid for it, so I'm, I'm going to hold on to it for a while. Uh, the methods, are, you know, well, most of what I described there and relatively simplistic, you could probably, in an afternoon of hacking on Perl or Python, come up with more or less the same kind of thing. <laughs> But um, like I said, uh, there is some sort of commercial uh, interest in it from uh, some contractor friends of mine, um, so I'm holding off for a while. Alan? Uh, just real quick, um, do you have any sort of like, uh, just any quick and dirty benchmarks that you can do that's like pretty close to you using kind of running time you have to do that? Benchmarks? Um, nothing terribly interesting, I guess, in the terms of number of clusters. So I basically go through about 1,000 stories a day. That forewarns probably. Um, maybe a couple hundred different clusters during the course of the day, averaging anywhere from 50 to two stories, or even one story, in that kind of remainder of a cluster. Uh, I use some thresholds for the frequencies and the word sizes to kind of uh, keep down the, the junk, if you will. Um, 1,000 stories a day is actually not too bad, so uh, in terms of the, the pace of things. But only about 30% of those ever get clustered and ever displayed. So again, the heavy tail problem. Um, one of the inter more interesting benchmarks, I guess, is that at the time, uh, the original implementation was actually written, um, I was using an older Power Mac from the mid-90s that I had. Um, the disk actually died recently. 
Um, but basically, the uh, running time for that was about 40 minutes at the time, because it was very, very file system intensive. And I have it now running on the iMac G5 using Postgres as a backend instead of a flat file. And the running time is now like five minutes. <laughs> and the, the pure Python implementation that I have, which resides all in memory on my laptop, actually um, runs in like two minutes. But it runs on about half the sources. One of the, the key limitations is, it is fetching the sources. So basically, if a site's unresponsive, it basically, it basically blocks the rest of the application for a while. So it's a pretty crappy model. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, find me later. I'm going to have those books, and I, I, really, I just want to get rid of them. So hopefully you guys will like them. But I do appreciate your time, and hopefully this is interesting. Thank you.